so nice that uh, we started so late that the latecomers were on time. Good to have Amy back with us today. Glad Shannon's back. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Got some prayer requests to talk about the next part of the service. Is this loud enough? Do I need to turn it up? Forsaken the, uh, the Sunday school request for women of the Bible. In working on that, I kind of morphed into something else. We're going to talk about the Lazarus family Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. So, women of the Bible plus a new. Pretty company, you know what to say. If you're in the book of Luke, chapter 10, verse 38. Let me know by saying amen. Amen. We'll have it up here. Now that's one thing, though. This wall is a lot bigger than the TV we're using, isn't it? Amen. <laughs> oh, great. Now we'll get a new building. Yep. I need a 90 inch monitor <laughs> so I can see it. Can you get a theater size screen? TV's old, but you can't see the little monitor no more. It says, Now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was covered about with much serving, and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Let's pray this morning over our, le over our lesson, the Lazarus family. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to be, be in your house, Lord. Thank you for everyone that is here. It's a blessing, God. Thank you for your presence. I pray that you anoint this lesson, Jesus. Let us learn from it, be better because of it, for your sake and your glory, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. In your holy name we pray. Amen. All right, so we're going to try to do an in-depth look at what we can learn. You may say that Brother Mike, you've heard this story a million times and there's nothing new we can learn from it. And that may be true. Maybe you're better than me. But I was actually able to see things at least worded a little differently that it reignited a little excitement with me, so hopefully I can portray that to you. But let's start with the basic, so the foundation is obvious that they're both sisters, Martha's the oldest, and it's obvious in this story that they both are too busy to be of any use to each other. If y'all remember, we did a, a Wednesday night series on Mary and Martha last fall, and I like the way they put that out, because it did not make Mary out to be the, the perfect person. Had, they, had the sisters worked together, every tour could have got done and every one could have fellowship with Jesus. But as it is, with each of them sticking to their own plan, Martha missed out on hanging out with Jesus. And who knows what tour got missed because Mary didn't help. So it's important. I want to speak to those people who don't understand the importance of work. We were created for the purpose of worship. However, we were called to work. I remember, I'm very good use to write this down in your Bible, I guess, but you're going to hear me say it a lot. I remember at Harden, there was a person who had been going there for three years at this time, and I asked him, so and so, can you go get the vacuum for me so I can vacuum this up? And he said, where's the vacuum? If you've been attending a church for three years and you don't know where the vacuum is, you are not a member of that church. You just go and take advantage. The Bible 
says if you don't work, you shouldn't eat. So if, you, if all you know how to do is come in here and, and get what you want, and you don't know how to participate in the chore, you are you're dead weight, if I can put it that way, be so blunt. Because we are all in this together, and if we would all work together, then we can all worship together, and we'll get it both accomplished better. Does that make sense this morning? Amen. Guess not. That's okay. Let me put it to you this way. If we happen to have one of those services where we don't even get to preach it, you've been there before, you know, it's like the worship just takes off. Worship is great, but that's not how you build a church. That's not how you grow in the Word. And it, I, I, I remember Brother Gaddy, he was here two Wednesdays ago. Y'all met him. He, they came and brought us the keyboard. He told the story a long time ago now. Man, I'm feeling old. So I don't know how long ago it was back when he was a kid. He said their church had that three weeks in a row. And on the fourth week, the pastor started the service off with the book of Mark. Turn with me. No worries. Because the pastor knew that if he gave them a chance to worship again, they may not get to preaching. And it is through the foolishness of preaching that we are saved. Worship is not all it's about. We have to work. So if you want to be effective, you have to do more than just worship. But still, in the context of this story, Mary was more right than wrong. And Martha was more wrong than right. But Martha is not a villain. Story. She's not a horrible person. She's not mean. She loved the Lord. She was honored to have him there. Throughout the Bible, she's never displayed as anything less than one of his disciples. How, but she allowed this distraction to make her become spiritually unbalanced. And if you're not careful, your good works will be useless because you become distract, distracted and spiritually unbalanced. There's a verse in 2 Corinthians 10 and 12 says, for we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves among themselves are not wise. Simply put, do not compare yourselves to anyone else. You say, okay, you nod your head, but we do it. We come in here and you want to know why so-and-so gets to do this. Why the pastor lets so-and-so do that or you can't sing as good as so-and-so, or you're not as talented as so-and-so. All we do is compare ourselves to each other, and that's what happened with Martha. She wanted to know why she was doing all the work, and Mary got to sit at the feet, and she thought it was not fair. Master, do you not care? Listen to that. Does she really think that Jesus didn't care about her? Of course she knew Jesus cared about her, but she became so distracted that her prayers were warped. We need to be careful, lest we do the same thing. She lost focus. She became more focused on her sister than on the Lord. And I've seen folks come to church with a chip on their shoulder, and they're more focused on their adversary or their rival than they are what they can get from the presence of the Lord. Martha's gripe was more about pride than it was her hurt. She wasn't hurt that she had to do all the Chores. She thought herself to be special because she was the one working. She thought she was better than Mary because she was the one working. And she wanted, to, she wanted Jesus to acknowledge that she was working. Now, you've been there before. Go back when you were younger, if you had younger siblings. And if you were the only one doing chores, that's natural. You wanted mom and daddy to know, I'm the one doing chores. Boy, Daniel, will get, he'll just punch a lot for no reason. Because Daniel feels like he does all the work in the house and a lot of it does not. And I'm not necessarily saying that's totally untrue there. I'm just saying it's relatable. It's relatable. Martha wanted Jesus to say, look at me. Or look at me. She wanted Jesus to say, I'm so proud of you, Martha. You're working so hard. We need to be careful of our self-righteousness. Martha actually got to a point where she acted as if Jesus needed her works more than she needed Jesus. See, that was new to me when I was studying this. When I put that together, I hadn't put it together that way before. She thought that her works was more important than sitting at the feet of Jesus. One of the first things I, I, I asked when I came here, and some of y'all know about it, is 
I'm different. If we have a supper after service, I don't particularly care for anyone leaving the service to go prepare the meal so it's ready at the end of service. I don't like that. And this is part of the reason why. That meal is not more important than the word of God and the altar call. We can wait an extra 20, 30 minutes to reheat the food and visit with each other and still have a good service. No one is more important enough to put Jesus aside in the world. That makes sense? Makes sense. Thank you. Some of you may be saying it, but I'm not hearing it. That's okay. I'm going to move on anyway. I need you to understand that the, the rebuke that Jesus gave her was a soft one. Because, again, she's not a builder. She just got distracted. She just got a little swayed a little bit, and he brought her back. And I love the fact that nothing shows that Martha was being rebellious or scorned from that rebuke. When we, see, when we visit them again later in the Bible, she continues to believe in the Lord. That's incredible. The word of the Lord never hurts the feelings of someone who loves the Lord. It may step on your toes. It may make you feel convicted, but it won't chase you out the door. If the word of the Lord chases you out the door, you never loved him to begin with. She loved him, and she understood that whatever he said was right, and it made her better. So now, who exactly is Lazarus in this story? He is their brother. By his custom, he would be the head of the house. It does not describe his, his job, he may, his occupation. He may have been retired. Uh, but we know the times of the day that the man was the breadwinner. So whether he worked or was retired, they lived off of what he provided. And that's important later when you know the rest of the story of Lazarus, how important it was. Let's read about Lazarus. John chapter 11, verse 1. Brandon's getting quick. I like that, Brandon. Good job. <laughs> John 11, 1. I hear Peyton's turn. I'll give you a chance. All. Anytime somebody wants to read in their personal Bible set on the wall, I encourage that. I will always wait. Good? Thing. Okay. It says, Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou loveth is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. You need to understand that sometimes Jesus will purposely wait even after he hears your dire need, emergency, prayer request. Does that make him any less God? No. Does that make him any less perfect? Everything about him is perfect, including his decisions and his timing. If you lose a job because of it, that's perfect. If I could be so bold, and, and if you lose a loved one because of it, Again, I don't, I don't need to repeat my stories, but a friend of mine lost his mother when he was 16. I heard him preaching later when he was 30. He said if he could go back in time and prevent his mom from having a heart attack, he wouldn't. Because that would mean that, his, that God had it wrong. He would rather trust God and not have his mama than to have his mama and not have a God he can trust. Spoke to me forever. Who am I to say I don't trust God no more? When he has the ability to lay his dead mother at God's hands and say, I trust you. Go back to your surgical room. Just mess with you, baby. She turned around. Uh, this is Sunday school, so just for the sake of learning some details here about the scripture. When he says the town of Mary and her sister Martha, believe it or not, there are some people that take that literally and they believe that Mary and Martha owned the city. And 
that the residents were their tenants. That's not what it means. It just simply refers to the town in which they live. It, it speaks the same way of where Andrew and Peter lived, the town of Andrew and Peter. It's talking about where they live. So when it says it was that Mary, now this is a crucial. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. When you read the Bible well enough to understand John's habits and John's traditions, John has a habit of referencing something he's going to write in the future. When he introduced Judas, he introduced him as the one that will betray Jesus. He introduced him as a thief. But you know what John never does when he writes? Refers to another gospel writer. I do not believe that this is the same adulterous sinner woman that, wiped, that washed his feet with her hair. I believe this is two separate events. Go read all four Gospels, record one or the other, or both. And I know that this is not the one at the Pharisee's house where that he said, if that man knows him, what type of woman would touch him. Because the Bible doesn't, that, that's not the Mary that's described anywhere else. That's a different person, that's a different Mary. That's important to know here later on. So, this is not that Mary. Now, Lazarus is sick. The ladies were close enough to Jesus that they knew where he was and how to reach him. That's important to know in those days. It's not like they had email or text message, Instagram or whatever, Snapchat. It was a little more complicated to get a message to somebody and to, to be within range or to be within a, a, know, a knowledge of where they're at and be able to reach them. That lends to a relationship, a friendship there. Hey, I know where he's at. I can find him. And that's important because it, it describes their relationship. It says that he loved them. But you know what it doesn't say? Why he loved them. Nowhere in the Bible does it describe how their relationship started. It doesn't say that one day while he was traveling, they befriended him. It doesn't say that he helped get a tree out of the cat. He did a small miracle. It doesn't say how it started. All we know is somewhere down the line, they became not just friends, but good friends. And he loved them. I think that's great. I think that is significant of its own. Because again, going back to comparing ourselves, some of us feel insignificant compared to others because we don't have the testimony of other people. I've known young people who feel inadequate because they have not done drugs and alcohol, so they feel their testimony is not as powerful as others. It doesn't matter how you started your walk with Jesus. And let me tell you, a child who can go through life without going that way is more powerful than the one who failed and had to get back up. Okay? Don't let yourself believe that because you don't have that moral authority and you're not as strong, you are stronger than the one who got knocked down. Think of it as a boxing match. Okay? After 10, after 10 fights, you start to wonder, man, that, that fighter's never been challenged. He never got punched in the mouth. I wonder what happened if he got punched. But after 50 matches, he still ain't got knocked down. You're saying, that dude's tough. And such is the Christian who never had to go that way and never had to pick themselves back up. That dude's tough. It doesn't matter how you started your walk with Jesus. All that matters is he loves us all and he has a relationship if you would allow him that way. Don't compare your relationship with someone else's. It doesn't matter how you got started. All that matters is that you started. Now here it says Jesus purposely waited. I believe it was hard for him to wait. I believe that while he knew what he was doing, he still loved them and he knew it was hurting them. And I believe it hurt him. Sometimes you do things that's best for your children and it hurts you more than it hurts them. John 11 and 14. If you're reading with me in your Bible, you might want to just go ahead and keep it on John 11. 11 14. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. They thought he was referring to taking a nap. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, to the intent he may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, Let us also go that we may die with him. Then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. 
Let's talk about Thomas for a second. He gets a bad rap as Thomas the Doubter. Here, I'm not going to talk about what he said when Jesus rebuked him for you believe because you see, blessed are those who believe without seeing. I'm not going to talk about that. But right here when he says, let us go that we may die with him. That's not Thomas being Eeyore. Let us go die with Lazarus. And you read that whole chapter. I skipped the verses for the sake of time. They didn't want to go back. They told Jesus, Master, they tried to stone you the last time. You want to go back? So when Thomas said, let us go die with him, he was not being doubtful. He was being courageous. He thought Jesus was leading to the death, and he's saying, let's go. He was actually being, he was actually showing faith in Jesus. All right. You want to go die? Let's go die. I trust him. That's awesome. That's incredible for a man that gets labeled as a doubter. He meant literally, let's go die. Let's go get stoned. myth in their time that they believe that someone could be mispronounced, misjudged, and though they thought they were dead, but they're not, but after three days, whoop, they're really dead. So the fourth day was to confirm that it really was dead and not just almost dead. John 11 and 20. We're going to read a minute here. Matter of fact, I'm going to get me a bottle of water. Y'all see I was smart enough to bring me a bottle of cold water this time? Every service, I tend to bring one more thing that I need. They're getting better. Let me take a drink. If I can never get this open, it feels kind of weird. Then Martha, as soon as he heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She said unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God which should come into the world. And when she had so said, she went her way and called Mary, her sister, secretly, saying, The master is coming, and called her unto him. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came unto him. Now Jesus was not yet coming to the town, but was in that place where Martha met him. The Jews then which were with her in the house and comforted her when they saw Mary, that she rose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, she goeth into the grave to weep there. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping which came with her, he groaned in his spirit and was troubled, and said, Where have you laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Jesus will. Martha is still trusting the Lord. Sort of. She, she didn't know to what depth he, he, he was capable of, but she knew he was the answer to some degree. But she takes comfort in his presence. She didn't have the faith or the understanding for, for the resurrection. And I tell you what, I see that a lot in our churches today. We're happy to come to church because we know we should. 
We like what we feel. But truth, truly deep down, we don't really have that faith in the resurrection. If we did, we'd be a little happier with our worship. We'd pray a little harder at the altar. But we almost just, can, just yield to the fact that it's over and I'm just happy to still be here. I want you to notice how she ran out. Martha's impulsive, kind of like Peter in that area. She ran out. But she had no faith. Some people are like that. They're all action, but they're no depth. Some of the loudest people in the church are the shallowest when it comes to faith. And that's really making a difference. Don't comp again, don't compare yourself to others. Don't, don't pat someone on the back just because they're making a lot of noise. They may just be making noise. Have no nothing, no root growing down deep, and not have any faith in the resurrection. They're quick to move, but don't have any faith in their actions. Mary, on the other hand, again, just like last time, here she is again in gross. Just completely mind focused on one thing. This time it's grief. So she didn't come out right away until, until she heard, oh. She was waking from her, her, her grief. Man, Jesus is here. Now listen. She was engrossed in grief. And her prayer was still one of grief. But it was a form of worship. How can her grief be worshipped? Because of her stance. She fell at his feet. Martha came out quickly. But did, never did really worship him. Mary came out and worshipped him with her honesty. There's a difference. God loves your honesty when it's in worship. When's the last time you were on your knees telling God, it's okay, whatever. God, I don't understand why my husband's this way. I don't understand why my marriage is this way. God, I don't understand why my job is this way. But you got your hands in the air at the same time. There's nothing wrong with that. That is a broken and contract heart being honest with God in your worship. The Bible says God will not despise a broken and contract heart. I'm telling you, that's a powerful, powerful prayer closet moment. If you're ever in that place, don't be ashamed to be honest with God. There is more power in having your hands up and telling God everything than just sitting there like this. no strength in this. There's nothing in that. John eleven thirty eight. 38. We're continuing the story. Jesus therefore again groaning in himself cometh to the grave. It was a cave and a stone lay upon it. Jesus says, take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, say to him, again, no faith in the resurrection. Lord, by this time he sinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Jesus saith unto her, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldst believe, thou shouldst see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always. Now listen, people are confused about why God, why Jesus prayed. Here he's demonstrating the example that he said it. I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto them, Loose him, and let him go. Now we're getting to the fun part of the story, right? Who had to remove the stone? The people. I need you to understand this, because some of you have been praying for a miracle. Why didn't Jesus speak the stone away? He could have blew it away. He could have thumped it away. He could have 
could have, he could have moved the stone himself. He made them do it because they're the ones that put the stone there in the first place. Some of you have buried your miracle, your prayer. You're praying out of obligation. If I can be honest with you, maybe you're praying for a lost loved one to come back to church, but in the recesses of, of your mind, you lost faith in that resurrection a long time ago. And, if, and in reality, you buried your miracle. You're still praying for it because you'd like to see it, be nice one day, but you have no faith. You have no expectancy. So in your own heart, you put that stone there. Maybe that's too deep, I don't know. But I feel it that we do that sometimes. There's things that we pray for that we really don't expect to happen. That's right. And I rebuke that in Jesus' name. Somebody's got cancer, let's go ahead and remove that stone. If they die, we'll let Jesus put the stone back. But in the meantime, I'm removing any blockage between me and in my mirror. He made them remove the stone because they're the ones that put the stones out there in the first place. We get excited about why he calls Lazarus by name. Brandon, we're going to embarrass you real quick because you're going to do this one here. Do you know why he called Lazarus by name? That's good. That's because I got him a note. See, not anyone does know. He called Lazarus by name because if he just said, come forth, without speaking to someone specifically, and everyone in that tomb would have been obligated to obey the voice of God and come forth. That would have been a hairy situation. You know how many dead mother-in-law would have came back? <laughs> so now, Lazarus is alive, but he's still bound. Going back to that stone, he told the captains, the same people who bound him, he wrapped them up, they have to go loose them and let them go. You have to find that person. And I, I know I'm speaking metaphorically. You know what I'm talking about. Maybe you don't. If you don't find, guard your heart. Don't bury anyone prematurely. But if you have that loved one that you've already given up on, not you, you remove the stone, but go ahead and loose them in your mind. Go ahead and picture them dancing. They can't dance if you got them bound up. Go ahead and finish loosening them and letting them go. It's time to believe in a resurrection. Brother Mike, how do I do this craziness that you're talking about in prayer? Consistent, habitual prayer. In prayer, give thanks in advance for the things that you want to see. And picture it and get excited about it. Let your faith rise. Go ahead, and, go ahead and invest your hopes. Some of us are afraid of hoping because we don't, we don't want to be disappointed. Tough news. Go ahead and invest your hopes. You can't be cautious and have faith at the same time. John 12 and 1. We're going to come back to 11 here in a second, but I'm jumping ahead for a second. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. So here again is what I believe John was referring to in chapter 11. He was telling you what he was going to talk about in 12. Well, how about this for a, a funeral reception, huh? You know, every funeral, Americans are one of the few cultures that have the, the, the party after a, a burial. It's kind of morbid that we do it, but how about having a funeral reception with the deceased looking at you, eating with you? Kind of neat. Hopefully he's fully recovered and not zombified. <laughs> he's got an eyeball hanging. Pass the potatoes. He's kind of awkward. Now, remember what I said about Mary washing his feet. 
Go back to here. I hope that now it adds a whole other dimension to the worship. This was not a sinful woman at his feet. This was a desperately grateful woman washing his feet. Notice that Martha didn't give her a hard time this time. She learned her lesson. But Mary, who just days before was overwhelmed with grief because they lost their brother, the breadwinner, the head of the house, their loved one, everything so special. But now he's back, and it's because of this man that she's sitting in front of, who not only loved him, but he came back just to do this wonderful miracle. She was overcome with gratitude, and her worship showed that gratitude. Does that, does that ring a bell? Does, it, does that touch anyone else's heart besides mine? Does that seem a little awesome to anyone else? And let me ask you something. This may hurt a little bit. Does your worship reflect your gratitude? Only you can answer that. I need to make sure. First of all, you need to ask yourself, do you know why you worship? I know why I worship. I know what I would be without Jesus. I know what I have because of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I may not worship the priest. But you will hear me worship every song because I'm grateful. And I refuse, refuse to let one opportunity of worship go by and I sit there and tell God he's not worthy of my worship. You just don't inspire me, God. I've been to too many race back games, calling the hogs. No, I'll put my and I'm not ashamed to put my hands in the air and call it off. You may think that's blasphemous or whatever, but because I raised my hands for Jesus, I'm not convicted. And if I didn't raise my hand in church and raise my hand and call it off, yeah, that'd be kind of sad. But I raise my hands in church every song. I have sometimes I have no clue that that song they sung this morning was new to me. The first verse, I'm learning it with you. But I started to get the hang of it by the chorus. When I don't know, and I'm horrible with the beats, so when I can't clap, it's because I'm grateful. Oh, I'm so grateful. Does your worship reflect the proper level of gratitude? Let's go back to John 11, verse 45. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did, believed on him. But, I'm starting to wrap it down, by the way, in case you're wondering how long I'm going. It's only been 45 minutes. That's not bad for some of you. But, some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees in a council and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. That miracle was the last straw for the leader. The ointment was the last straw for Judas, but the miracle was the last straw for the leader. Jesus knew going back that they wanted his head. I need you to understand that he sacrificed himself for that miracle. He knew what was happening. He knew what was going to happen. In order to give them Lazarus back, he, he sacrificed himself. Now those leaders were so worried about their position. And it's easy for us to judge them and say, oh, those silly leaders. But we do the same thing. That's why so many people won't commit to the Lord. Because they want the Savior, but they don't want the Lord. They want someone that will forgive them for their sins, but they don't want someone that will tell them how to live their life. You are your own Pharisee. You're so worried about your position of being in charge of your life. That you won't let Jesus be Lord. But again.
again, going back to Jesus sacrificing himself, I wonder if you understand the cost of your miracle today. And if you do, I ask you one more time, does your worship reflect the proper level of gratitude, considering the cost of your miracle? These are the lessons learned from the Lazarus family. Do we have any questions, comments, or concerns?